right, guys, we'll get started here. My name is Jesse. I'm with CAD Dimensions. Uh, thanks for joining me today on this webinar on Visualize Professional, specifically on working with camera keys. Uh, I've got a lot of information for you guys today on the process and techniques that I use in creating animations uh, using only camera motion. Um, and I want this we webinar to be a, a good resource for you guys to come back to um, and be able to you know, repeat these, um, these techniques. Uh, so <clears throat> I've got some important background information here in here as well. Um, I may go over 30 minutes. There's a, a very good chance of that, but uh, this will be recorded. So uh, you can always access this information in the future on our uh, website or on the YouTube page. Um, if you do have any questions along the way, feel free to type those in in the questions dialog box there. Uh, I'll get to those. I'll check that at the end. Uh, so if you have any questions there or afterwards, you can contact us, of course, as well. So uh, we'll get going here. So before I start, and I used this slide in my last uh, Visualize versus Photo View webinar uh, last week or a couple weeks ago, um, is what does Pro actually offer? It's a good question, um, and it's a question that we've been getting quite a bit as to what does Visualize Pro offer over the standard mode, and there is a lot. Um, I picked some of the things out of the list. This isn't even the full list uh, of stuff, but I kind of cherry pick some things out that I really like. Um, this is kind of an overwhelming list, so uh, the things that I've kind of highlighted in red here are some of my favorite things. Uh, this gives you, Pro gives you access to using configurations, uh, what this means in rendering terms this is kind of like a display state in SOLIDWORKS so you can do uh, configurations which would be different uh, configurations of visual properties uh, not related to geometry here but uh, that allows you to make different colorways for your products uh, you can render all configurations and cameras uh, all together so you can just blast those things out um, We've got a turntable with a presentation mode, which was really neat. So you can have the the model kind of rotating around, so you can sort of talk to that and show you know potential clients or uh, internal or external. <clears throat> One of my favorite things that Visualize Pro offers is the virtual reality and panoramic mode. And this alone, I think, is worth uh, the price of Pro. What this allows you to do is render your model or sort of pre-render your model in a bunch of different frames. And it will export with a JavaScript that you can embed into your website. And people can access your website and spin and manipulate the model around. And the JavaScript basically switches from frame to frame to frame. And it makes it look like it's rendering in real time, even though it's a fairly lightweight operation. Uh, that's just kind of uploaded to your website. Really cool. Same thing with the panoramic, of course. You're just kind of panning from side to side. Awesome functionality there, and I'm sure that I'll have more information on that coming up in the near future. Um, skipping over, I'll skip a couple here just for time's sake, but uh, of course animations and video formats is one of the things that uh, comes with Visualize Pro, um, and specifically we'll be looking at uh, cameras today, but you can see there's a, you can keyframe essentially anything in the software. So for today, you can see what a very, very small snippet of Visualize Pro we're even accessing today, and even in this realm, we, we'll just kind of scratch the surface in terms of uh, what we can do. Again, I wanted to show you guys some sort of simple things that you can re create these types of moves and motion uh, in your animations. Uh, so we won't even get to all there is to talk about in with regards to uh, setting camera keys, but uh, you can see a very small portion of what Pro actually offers we'll get to today, but there'll be more information coming up in the future. All right, so my plan for today is to uh, start off with rendering goals, uh, what we're really shooting for most of the time when we're creating renderings, and then how do we accomplish uh, hitting those goals when we're creating renderings. Uh, we'll go over some camera background information because that's kind of what we're going to be focusing on today, uh, using cameras in, in uh, Visualize Pro and how to animate those. And then we'll get right into some techniques that I've used. I'll show you guys a sample little clip that I made uh, towards the end here. And uh, I'll have some samples along the way to kind of show you some of the techniques that I use. And again, I'll have that sample product for you at the end. So our goals when we're rendering things is typically to create something eye-catching. The whole purpose of making something look photorealistic is to get someone something that will catch someone's attention um, or pull some emotion out of them. Or to have the viewer take action, if you you know you want someone to to get to your website, click on that image or something like that, uh, to to pull them in and see what what it is you're doing with that product. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, mostly we're trying to give life to our renderings, we're to our you know to our models, uh, and bring some excitement and and be able to let people experience what the product might be like or what we want them to feel uh, with the product. 
So with SolidWorks Visualize, we have really three options in, in creating content. Uh, the first one is the static rendered image. That's the standard thing that you'll, uh, you'll see out there as far as rendering something similar to what I have faded out in the back of the slide, uh, just a regular JPEG image. Uh, the second option is a rendered video. This is the one that we're going to be focusing on today or a subset that we'll be focusing on today specifically with camera motion. Uh, the third option that you have in SolidWorks Visualize also involved with Pro is the interactive web content. And the interactive web content, if you haven't seen that, is really, really cool. Um, that's going to have to be a topic for another day, but I think that alone is good reason to pick up uh, Visualize Pro. But again, today we'll be looking at uh, sort of the easiest way in, I think, uh, to, to rendering videos, and that's going to be just camera motion uh, with Visualize Pro. Now, again, if we look back to what our goals were, we're trying to create something eye-catching, get the user to take action and add life and emotion to these. Um, we, we look at our options that we have available to us, and the static rem rendered image is probably actually the most difficult to engage the user. You have to uh, have elements in that photo that are uh, exciting and, and will generate interest or interesting to look at, where the rendered video and the interactive web content, just due to what they are, are much easier to engage a user. Now, the downside to this has always been that uh, the videos and the and the interactive kind of stuff, well, we've never been able to do interactive web content, but videos and things like that, even with PhotoView 360, uh, have been fairly difficult to generate something that looks really nice. Um, with Visualize becoming available, I've actually kind of changed my tune as to what I think the best bang for the buck or what the lowest hanging fruit is um, for renderings. And I think that now uh, rendering videos, even with just simple camera motion, is really the, the best way to go in terms of minimizing your effort and maximizing the impact. Now, if we take a look at this further, uh, static images, you, you can, and I'm sure you've seen really nice uh, product photography. Um, I have a couple samples here of, of just things that I found interesting around the web, but you can see most of the time uh, you've got images that really pull you in. Uh, they're images that are often very difficult to render. You know, something like this with water splashing around the bottle or, you know, extra items in here. Even this one that's basically just the product, um, you know, on, on a texture, uh, there's some water droplets in here and even without the water droplets getting this lighting uh, correct in a rendering could be pretty difficult you know things like this where we've got a lot of refraction issues to take care of and uh, you know this gorgeous side lighting and getting this to illuminate properly even in something like this if you could get the the watch rendered properly uh, the background you know we don't have a model of rocks that we can just throw in the background so getting the lighting to match on even just a background image or something like that it's it's actually very difficult to create really engaging single images uh, using rendering software, at least using CAD style rendering softwares. Now, when you contrast that to something like this, I mean, you've all seen commercials and, and videos like this product videography. Uh, it's so much easier to create something that will draw your, um, your customer or uh, potential customer in because there's so much more motion and you don't have to have uh, all of those elements. I mean, you certainly can and good product videography will include the same elements, but you can see where I'm going and that it's so much easier to draw some, some, uh, someone in with something that already has that kind of motion in it. All right, so when it comes to rendering, now that visualize is an option, um, the question, I guess it would be static versus animation. And in that case, I'm going straight to Hollywood. So let's go make some videos. So the techniques that we're going to look at in this session um, are kind of listed out here. And again, these are techniques that I've pulled from things that I would typically shoot with my actual camera if I'm shooting videography stuff. Uh, these are things that techniques that I would use, and I think they, uh, they can be applied in a rendering sense very, very easily. So we'll take a look at some of these uh, types of shots, and hopefully you guys can take these shots and apply them to your products and uh, be able to clip something together that looks really nice in the end. 
Now, a couple of things to keep in mind when I'm creating these renderings, I always try to make things feel as hand done as possible. That will make them feel uh, more natural and not so sterile. Um, so again, we're trying to mimic things that people would see in real uh, film movies. Uh, again, where I've kind of taken some of these types of shots um, and subtle moves go a long ways. We'll see that as we move into actually setting keys, it's very easy to overdo it. Uh, so slight motion is, is often has a very big impact. So before we go too far, um, I want to give you guys some background again as a reference that you can come back to. And if you're not aware of how a camera works, basically uh, what happens here is light comes in through what's called the aperture. And this is just a, a hole in the front of the camera that's adjustable in size. So you can see kind of a large hole versus a small hole. And as the light comes through that aperture, it will then pass through a shutter, which is open for a certain amount of time and then it will hit the sensor. Now, when we're rendering, we don't really have to worry about the shutter so much because the shutter is mostly just controlling how much light comes through and hits the sensor. So we don't really have to worry about exposure so much, um, but the aperture is something that we can make use of in rendering. And you can see what happens in a real camera, what, what uh, this adjustment helps us do, aside from controlling how much light comes through, um, you'll see that with a larger size hole, as that goes through the lens and goes towards the sensor, you see that it converges essentially at different angles. And that effect gives us a narrow versus a large depth of field. So you'll see with a, a physically large aperture, you'll get a very narrow depth of field. So that means that um, sm a smaller amount of the image will be actually in focus. Uh, things in the background or in the foreground will fall in and out of focus, where if you have a very small physical uh, size aperture, you'll end up with more things in focus. So you can use that to your advantage to try to highlight things that you want the the viewer to uh, see or focus on. So you can see from here we have uh, sort of a range of <clears throat> uh, an f-stop value, uh, which uh, is slightly confusing in that small values equate to large physical sizes of the aperture. So the smaller the f-stop, the larger the aperture, which means you'll end up with a shallower depth of field. All right, so it seems like there's a lot of backwards thinking there, but you can see in this image we have a small uh, f-stop value, which means a large aperture, and you can see that we have a shallow depth of field where these uh, objects in the foreground are in focus, and then as things move back, they fall further and further out of focus, where with a larger uh, f-stop value that equates to a smaller uh, physical size, you'll see more things in focus. So the focus point is still up here, but the objects in the background don't fall out of focus. And that's a technique that you can use to, again, highlight something that you want the user to focus on. So here we have uh, how this would be applied in the uh, rendering sense. And again, we'll take a look at the controls as to how to do this. But I've got this animation set here so that we're keeping the camera in the same spot and we're actually just adjusting the aperture. So you can see this one will sweep from an F1 to an F22. And as that um, fans out, you'll see more and more of it come into focus. So you'll see here as the F1, we have most of the background out of focus. And as it ramps up to the F22, you'll see it come into focus. All right, so hopefully these videos come through on the uh, GoTo meeting here. But again, if they're, they're not, this will be up on the web. Uh, so you can come take a look back at that. Now the next thing is the focal length. And on a real camera, this is adjusted by actually swapping lenses on and off the camera. Um, so typically you've got your wide angle lenses which start around you know eight millimeters for like a fisheye or something like that and move up through the 20s generally. Uh, and this will give you a lot of the image uh, but the neat thing with wide angle lenses is as you move in closer to an object, you'll see actually uh, more perspective essentially built into that image. So it will kind of uh, distort things a little bit in, um, in the way that it shows perspective. And you'll start to lose that as you go up higher through the range of lenses. So mid range lenses, uh, you're looking at somewhere between the 30s and the 80s, 35, 50, 85, those types of uh, lenses. Uh, somewhere between 35 and 50 is usually what the eye would typically see. So this would give you a more natural, if you're just standing looking at the object, type of look. And moving up through uh, types of tel telephoto lenses usually start in the high hundreds and go uh, further up. And again, these will be uh, lenses that are uh, zoomed farther in. 
All right, so getting your camera uh, set in the right uh, position will be a combination of what lens size you're using, what your focal length is going to be, and physically where your camera uh, is in the rendering. Now, if you want to go uh, see something crazy, you'll see people out there using these massive, uh, massive lenses for shooting far, far away. Uh, typically, that's not a realm that we get into in, in rendering uh, because we don't have that physical sense of scale. We can kind of zoom in and out at will, so we don't need to look like this guy using massive uh, 800 millimeter lenses to try to uh, reach out to things. Now here's an interesting animation that I set up, uh, animating between a wide angle lens uh, out to a zoom lens or so. Uh, so you can see with this wide angle here, we get a lot of that exaggerated perspective and then it fades out as it uh, goes out to the 200 millimeter. So what I'm actually doing here is I'm changing the focal length, which again on a real camera would be done by swapping those lenses in and out. Uh, and I'm moving the camera in and out physically. So as the uh, size of the lens decreases, I'm moving the camera in to try to keep that framing of the shot the same. Now this is something you wouldn't be able to do in real life, which is why it looks kind of unnatural, uh, because you would again have to be swapping lenses in and out to to sort of get this effect, but you can see sort of the difference as to what those lenses would give you based on physical distance and uh, a different focal length lens. All right, so let's take a look at the uh, different techniques that we're going to be looking at. The first one is the pull focus, and this is done with an apparatus that uh, looks something like this, typically uh, called a follow focus. And usually someone would be, you know, in real scenarios, someone would be manning the camera in terms of where it's pointed, and then you'd have somebody else on the follow focus um, actually adjusting the focus. So two different people operating the camera uh, and they'll be, they'll be controlling what's actually being focused on. So if you have a small aperture value or a large physical aperture, uh, you'll see that you know only portions of the image will be in focus. And uh, this person's job would be to make sure the right portions of the image are in focus. And we'll be able to control something very similar to that as we go into rendering. Okay, so here we see an, an example of uh, I'm fairly zoomed in so that your f-stop is actually higher than you would expect to, to get this kind of depth of field. Uh, but you'll see with the zoom lenses, it's a little bit exaggerated in terms of what depth of field you actually get. So from here, you'll see in focus and then that fades out to a focus on the gauge cluster back here. All right, so you can see how you can highlight something uh, up front here and then later in the shot highlight something back here. All right, that's called a focus bowl, and we'll take a look at that. The next type of shot would be a pan shot or a dolly shot, and you can see this is done with a slider as the camera kind of slides across some sort of dolly or rig. Uh, now this can go either way. A panning shot would be the camera moving across the object. Uh, technically, I think a panning shot is actually where the camera stays stationary and it just turns one way or another, but I think panning is kind of expanded in its um, terminology to, to kind of mean a shot that moves across the uh, across the object where a dolly shot is typically a same type of motion. You're just moving in or out of the object. So what we can see here is that we have a panning shot just moving kind of straight across the uh, the model. So imagine the camera sitting on kind of a rolling rig where it just sort of slides across and you don't need much motion to really add a lot of uh, life to a rendering like this. All right, so here's a shot where I do have some depth of field turned on with the slider. So this is a little more realistic, I suppose, in that you can see elements back here are kind of out of focus and they're sort of pulling in focus as the, the camera slides across them. So um, <clears throat> you'll see them go from in focus here to out of focus as they move past. Uh, so whatever's kind of in that range of the camera just sort of glances across in focus and gives kind of a neat effect. All right, so this is more similar to what you would really get out of a camera, uh, you know, in this case, using sort of a wide angle lens with a relatively shallow depth of field. 
Now here's the dolly in type shot. And again, uh, this is uh, sort of a similar uh, rig. If you were to do this in real life, you're just pushing into the object rather than uh, going across it. And you can see this gives a really nice effect, especially with a wide angle, because you're kind of getting things moving across. You're sort of really exaggerating the uh, perspective as it's coming into you. This, you know, this light section kind of really sucks you in and you can see this push bar sort of really pushing in towards you and things kind of moving uh, with a lot of, uh, um, energy. It just kind of really pulls you into the, the object to try to highlight what you're uh, trying to show. Now, one of the techniques that I like to use a lot in actual videography is to uh, move something with something in the foreground that's actually out of focus. And you can see this is what I've done here. I've actually added something to the model that will move out of focus. So I'm very close with my camera to the objects moving across this kind of railing thing in the front. Uh, and I'm focusing on the model in the background. Now you can see I it's easy to go too fast. I think in this shot, I actually kind of went too fast, um, but I knew that it was going into a more aggressive kind of reel, so I left that, but I did go back and make a slower one uh, that's just pushed in a little more with a little bit less motion. Uh, again, very easy to overdo these things, uh, but kind of interesting shots that you would see uh, normally in a videography reel and very easy to apply in the rendering realm as well. Now the next shot is a jib shot and this is a rig that you'll see something like this where the camera is uh, being moved up or down and you're controlling the direction of it. Typically you're trying to keep it straight up and down uh, but you can also you can see how uh, adjusting the the positions of these rods would also control the the uh, angle of the camera so you're kind of moving this up and down and controlling the angle as well so kind of a, a rising crane type shot and that would look something like this in the rendering sense so this one I did kind of uh, pull up and I also kept looking down so I sort of rotated the camera forward a little bit as well um, as you can see kind of pull up and over now the neat thing about rendering a jib shot is if you have anything a product of any you know uh, considerable size, um, this would be pretty tricky to do without some fairly expensive uh, hardware. So uh, again, if you have a small product, you could get up and over it with a camera pretty easy, but um, larger products, you can get a nice panning shot like this or a jib shot, excuse me, uh, with without having to uh, set up, you know, a, a full crane rig system. Uh, so kind of a cool shot that you wouldn't be able to get live sometimes. Now, a stabilizer shot, this is one that you'll see uh, with this kind of electronic stabilizer here. Um, this is one that's done typically by hand, and these are probably the hardest shots to actually accomplish with rendering. Uh, if you want to do something like this as just a small detail shot, that's usually not too bad. A couple of keys, you know, as you would kind of push a camera up and under something like this, uh, or in or around something. Uh, but once you start adding in multiple keys, things can get a little bit more complicated. And and you can see something like this where you're actually kind of doing like a walk around shot. Um, these types of things can be very difficult to get smooth and control how quickly you're going. Um, I think I actually went a little bit too fast on this one as well, but uh, you can kind of get the idea, right? If someone was kind of walking around with a stabilizer uh, to get this type of shot. Uh, the other type of thing that you could do with this would be like a flyby shot where you're sort of uh, walking by the, the object and then pulling away. So something like that uh, would be uh, that type of stabilizer shot. All right, so uh, from here, let's move into visualize. And once we're in visualize, we'll take a look at uh, setting some default settings for uh, animation and turning on the, our timeline. And then we'll take a look at actually adding in some cameras, uh, how to adjust those and record those changes, and then ship that out to a video once we're finished. All right, so here we are in Visualize, and I'm just gonna kinda start from scratch and show you guys how I set this thing up uh, right from the ground up. So the first thing I do is I'll bring in a model. I use Control-I to do that. File import works just the same. And I'll choose the model that we're going to be working with. Uh, I use the defaults here and just say okay. And you'll see when that brings that in, I've painted this model in SolidWorks. Those appearances will be carried over into Visualize, so you don't have to redo that. There might be a couple things you want to touch up. Sometimes I like the uh, Visualize appearances better, and I think we might do that here. And you can see that the model has been brought in uh, with the colors that I assigned in SolidWorks. 
one of the first things I do when I bring a model in is I'll always select it and just give that a right click and say snap to floor. Uh, that just sets that to the floor height. That seems to be uh, seems to be pretty accurate for most of the models that I bring in. So I usually do that right off the bat. Uh, one thing to keep in mind when you're doing that is you want to be set to the selection tool for the model. So if it's highlighting in yellow, then you're selecting the model itself and you'll have that option. Now the first thing I wanted to go over while we're in here is setting a couple settings for uh, working with animations, a couple defaults. Obviously right now we don't have the timeline turned on, so that's the first thing that we'll address. Uh, if we move up to view, you'll see there's an option in here for show timeline. The shortcut to this is control L. So if you want to use that, I tend to use that more so than I do through the menus. And once we show the timeline, you'll see that show up towards the bottom. Okay, now again, you'll only have this option if you have Visualize Pro. Now, actually, I don't tend to leave my timeline down here at the bottom. Uh, one of the things that I really like about Visualize is that you can split off these menus and you can set them somewhere else. So when I'm working on my own, uh, I'll have this timeline off on my other screen. I'll have my uh, toolbar off on another screen, and then I'll just have my rendering kind of maximized on one screen so I can really get a good feeling of uh, what I'm working on. I don't have to reduce my graphic size whatsoever to get access to the tools that that I need. So I'll move those to a secondary monitor, which is a, a nice feature of Visualize. Uh, again, I've only got one screen that, that we're working with here today, so I'll leave them on screen. Uh, one of the settings that I do like to set as a, a default um, is to set smoothing as my default behavior for keys. So if you go up to Tools and you drop down into the Options, We'll see a set of options in here um, that have uh, a number of tabs for different purposes. Under user interface, you'll find some timeline options here. I've set these to smooth. Now, I think the default is linear, if I remember correctly. Um, I've set mine both to smooth, and this does uh, what I assume is some kind of Bezier um, smoothing between keys. Uh, this will uh, set, uh, so the difference between linear and smooth would be a linear will just move directly from one key to the other where smoothing will have some kind of ramping. Now the ramping usually has a much more natural feel and especially because we're working with cameras I try to get as much of that in there. You can adjust that um, with you know on a key by key basis but I set my default so that they are set to smooth that way it just does it and I for, if I forget to go back or uh, something like that it will always uh, it will already be set and if you want to modify it on the fly then you can do that too but uh, I set mine to smooth and I've had pretty good luck with that. All right, so I have right now my graphics area set to just our preview. Again, if I snap over into fast, we'll see this start to uh, live render as we're uh, working with it. So it's initializing the render, and you can see we're now starting to get an idea of what this rendered result is going to look like. Now, a huge advantage with systems like this that are this what you see is what you get style rendering is that we can see what we're doing, you know, if you're rendering in fast mode. Uh, you can see what you're doing as you're making those adjustments. They're actually updating uh, live, which makes this a whole lot easier to work back and forth tweaking things, especially if you're not sure exactly what you want yet. Uh, you can make some changes, some adjustments, and actually see the results of those immediately. So as I toggle over here, I kind of like the way things are looking. You know, as I went back looking through the videos that I made, I, th I feel like this is maybe a little more reflective than I I wanted. But um, you know, these are not quite the the appearance that I'm looking looking for. So let's try to address that. Uh, I like to slide this out just so I have access to the whole list of things here as well. And what I did on the other uh, model that we were looking at earlier was I ended up using one of these automotive signal lights on these uh, clear plastic pieces at the front. And I felt that gave, gave it a much more uh, realistic look. The only thing that I modified on those from the uh, appearance tab here is I actually took the bump mapping off. So this does have a bump mapping that will give it kind of that signal light texture. Uh, I removed that off of there, just selected it and hit delete, just so they're straight clear uh, plastic. And that seemed to look uh, pretty nice. So like I mentioned, I usually pretty much bring things in right from SolidWorks and then take a look, see if there's anything that I want to address, uh, you know, as a tweak to the model. Uh, but mostly I'm, I'm usually pretty happy with what comes in from SolidWorks, at least from my experience so far. So in setting this up, again, I've got my appearances kind of dialed in. And as far as the scenes, uh, I think I used something like, uh, we'll move over here to the appearances uh, tab. We'll go over to environments. I think I applied something like a, 
out of Photo Studio, and then I used a back plate of some kind, some kind of gradient. So if we go down to our plates uh, in the studios, I think I used something like this. It looks fairly similar. All right, now again, if you do want to adjust uh, the way things are, are sitting in terms of your lighting, rotation, or anything like that, uh, you can uh, switch over into your environments, uh, your scenes tab here, and you can, you can work with these. So uh, if you want to make some tweaks to those, you can do that. Uh, I'm going to skip over that because that's not really what we're addressing today. Uh, today we're trying to look at how to add some motion to our cameras. So I'm going to switch over to the camera tab here. And from the camera tab, we'll start working with uh, creating and setting up our cameras. Now, what I typically do when adding, creating, modifying cameras is I will create one camera that I set sort of as the free camera. That way I can toggle back to this camera, move around, spin around without affecting any of my other cameras that are set up for specific uses. So for this default camera, what I'm going to do is just rename this to, uh, say, a free camera. Okay, and uh, with that free cam, that one's going to be the one that I'll go back to when I need to move around and look at how my camera, my other cameras might be moving. Uh, now, when we're actually looking at the camera properties, so you can see once I select a camera, uh, looking down through here, we have a lot of options for uh, cameras. And as I said, you know, even within just animating cameras, we'll only get to a, a small portion of this. But you can see a lot of these options do look pretty familiar. Hopefully, they look pretty familiar from what we've been talking about so far. So we've got, uh, you know, the the dolly in here. Let me actually pull this back into uh, into preview mode just so we speed things up a little bit. Okay. All right, so you can see that adjust that zoom. So remember that dolly in shot that we were talking about. We've got a distance, so that's the camera sliding into the model. Uh, we have a, an actual position for where the camera's uh, positioned. We have a twist, so we can actually turn the camera back and forth. We can adjust the perspective. Now, again, with perspective, I usually adjust this via the focal length. So remember, this would be kind of the swapping the lens off of the camera. And you can see right now it's set to a, something like a 90 millimeter lens. If I switch this over to something lower, 20, you'd get a more wide angle view. So I'll snap that down to 20. You'll notice that the, the object looks further away. But again, if we use that distance or dolly and slide that in, you get now a much more uh, aggressive looking uh, perspective. Remember when we talked about that. Okay, so here's usually where I adjust that. Now you'll notice that the uh, perspective as well as the focal length sliders move together. So they're kind of the inverse of each other. So as you're moving those, you see those two move together. Uh, so you can set that either way. I prefer to set it with the focal length because that's what I'm comfortable with, you know, understanding what these uh, numbers mean in terms of what result I'm going to get. But realistically, you could use either. Now, if you didn't want that, you can switch that right over to ortho view, which would give you no perspective at all, essentially. Uh, typically, when you're rendering, you're looking for something more realistic, more lifelike, uh, so you would probably want to be using perspective. Okay, so we'll skip down here a little bit. Uh, bloom options, this would be if you have lighting effects in there, you would get sort of that, uh, that cloudy glare. Uh, I typically add this in post. Um, I don't know why, that just seems to be my, my habit. Uh, but we do have the ability to render in bloom. Uh, which sometimes can be more accurate. The bloom that I added in the video that you'll see at the end, uh, I added in post, and it's not really all that accurate, but it looks good enough for you know what I wanted. Um, but that's an option that we, we don't have time to get into today. But depth of field is one that I, I do really want to talk about because that's what we already discussed uh, this morning. So you'll see that we have... Uh, a couple of options in here for depth of field, uh, one of them, of course, being turning depth of field on. So once depth of field is checked on, we have the ability to choose where what our focal distance is. So remember, this is what we're focusing on. If you think back to the uh, the eggs and the the straw or whatever the pasta that was in the background, how that fell out, uh, the the focal point would be on that uh, on those those grouping of eggs in the front. Uh, that's how we're choosing what is in focus. Now, how much is in focus? That's what we're changing with these options here. So you'll see that these guys again will move together. So these are sort of the inverse of each other. Uh, so you can set these either way. <clears throat> I tend to set set this as an f stop 
uh, value. Again, that's what I'm comfortable with. We looked at that range of 1.4 to uh, F16 or F22 or whatever that slide uh, had. And th that's what those numbers equate to. Now you'll notice that we don't see anything changing here at all as I'm moving these around uh, because right now we're not rendering. So let me actually turn my fast render back on so we can see what's happening here. And here you can see it's already starting to blur out. So I haven't really uh, got anything set here, but we have a very low f-stop. All right, so let's move the camera in a little bit. And instead of using my controls uh, directly from within here, I'm just going to use the camera control shortcuts for the keyboard. So I'll hold Alt and I'm going to use my right, right mouse button to slide myself in a little bit. That's kind of like that dolly in move. And from here, we'll set a focal distance. Now, I don't really know what the focal distance is that I want, but I just know that I want to focus on this light or something like that. So from here, I will manually select this with a point of focus. So if you click on the little eyeball, we can now choose what we want in focus. And you can see that that will adjust for that. Now my f-stop is pretty far down, so you can see we barely have anything at all in focus. So let's pop this up to something a little bit more reasonable, still low, but something more reasonable. Uh, we'll say maybe like two. Okay, so now we see a little bit more of, his, of it is in focus. Uh, maybe it's still falling out a little bit too quickly for me, so we'll jump this up to uh, three. Okay, now the nice thing is, again, we're not restricted to what values you would actually get out of a camera. Uh, we can really choose any value here to get any depth of field at any resolution we, we really like. So at this point, we've got, you know, kind of the front of the uh, object in focus, and you can see it start to fall out of focus towards the back. So maybe that's the effect that I'm going for. We can stick with that. Okay, so that's the effect that we're going for for the first pull focus. So let's set up a camera to do that. Now remember, this is my camera that I have set up just as my free cam. So I'm going to uncheck my depth of field. I don't really need depth of field turned on for this because I'm going to be moving this around. I just want to, uh, to be able to manipulate this. I don't need this as any artistic camera. So what I like to do is set up cameras for each shot that I need to do. So to create a camera, we can right click right within this pane and add new camera or we can deselect the cameras and you can see there's an option right here for new camera as well. So I'm going to switch over to new camera and I'll actually turn my rendering off while we're doing this just so I have a little bit of extra speed here. So this camera I'll use as the focus pull and we'll just add a camera for each shot that we're trying to do. We'll do a pan shot. We'll go with a dolly shot. We'll do a jib. And we'll add one for a stabilizer. I don't know if we'll get to this, but. Okay, now this isn't mandatory, um, but I do like doing this because this way I can keep my settings separate uh, per different shot. Um, and this is nice because I'm often doing different things. Some of them I have set up for depth of field, some of them I don't. Uh, so I would recommend setting up a camera for each shot that you're going to be setting up rather than trying to get the same camera to, to do all of those. So let's start with the focus pull camera. And again, I've left my free camera open. So we'll start with this one. I'll switch over to this camera. Uh, and we'll start making some modifications here. So with the focus pull, the shot that I use, we'll set up something similar to that. Uh, again, I will typically use the, the mouse controls to get these set up rather than using these controls, but you'll notice that as I'm moving this, you'll see those options being set as well. All right, so the focus pull, I set this with kind of a telephoto, mild telephoto, so I did a 200, I think, and we'll zoom in towards the back here. Again, I'm using uh, Alt and the right mouse button to do this now, Alt and the left. Uh, Alt and the middle mouse button to pan. All right, and we'll kind of close in here on this shot. Oops, sorry about that. So we had something like this, something in the foreground, something in the background that we can uh, we can view. 
So we'll see. Uh, that's that's how I like it. Whoops, I went too far. Right about there. All right, now in this point, we want to focus from here and then over the course of a few seconds, move our focus back out to here. So I'm gonna check on my depth of field, again, because this is the focus pull, and I'll select my initial point of focus around here because that's where we're going to start. Now, again, we don't see anything happening, so I'll turn my rendering back on to see where we're at. All right, now this might be a little too extreme for me. Again, I'm using a, a zoom type lens, so we're, uh, we're pretty far in there, so you'll see that depth of field kind of exaggerated. So we'll turn this up a little bit, uh, maybe to F10. I don't remember where we were exactly, but sure, something like that. All right, I think that's a little more exaggerated than I had in the in the video, but that's no problem. Okay, so from here, I want to save this as the first keyframe for this animation. All right, in order to do that, there's two ways we can do this. We can come up to the camera itself and right click. From here, we can add a keyframe. You'll notice the shortcut is Shift Control K. That's what I tend to use. So if as long as this camera is selected, I can add a keyframe here. Now let's move down to the timeline so we can see how this works here. The timeline will start adding in rows of keys. All right, now the timeline, of course, will move across in a length of time. You can see this marked out in seconds, and we can control what the frame rate of the video is. Now for draft quality videos, you can use a slower frame, light, frame rate like this. Uh, I recommend for finals to use a 25 or 30 uh, frame rate, uh, unless you have really fast uh, motion, which again, I, I don't typically recommend. So we'll set this to 25 frames. Uh, I do have my auto keys turned off. That's just my preference. Pretty much anything that I animate, I usually turn auto keys off. So at this point, we can create a keyframe, control shift K, or again, move up, right click and create keyframe. Now, as soon as I do that, you'll see this keyframe being added. And I have this now this row of animations. So it's created this animation called focus pole animation uh, based on the key that I just set for my focus pole camera, again, which is convenient. So I have this marked off. Now at this point, I want to move my timeline to somewhere later down. So we'll grab this uh, timeline. The red marker is the end of the animation. So let's say over four seconds, we want to uh, pull our focus from uh, where it is now to where it is out here. The yellow marker is the playhead, so we'll move that out to where we want to be as well. We'll say we'll go right to the end, and we'll make a change. So from here, I'll say let's adjust the focal distance out to here, and you can see my focus sort of inverts, if you will. Now, I made a slight change in position as well, so if you want to do that just to add a little bit of, uh, of energy to it, you can do that as well. Again, all we've got to do uh, is just uh, modify the camera, so uh, Alt and make a slight change. Uh, it doesn't take much, as I was saying earlier, slight changes uh, are really all you need to uh, to add a little bit of something to it. Now it has set a keyframe for me here. I always will uh, manually set a keyframe too, just to make sure that I've got the, the changes stored. So I'll set Control Shift K, or again, move up, right click and set that. Now from here, uh, we'll see across this animation, the focus point will change from here to here. Um, so if I move my cursor back, you can see that as it's rendering, it's a little hazy here because it's rendering quickly. Maybe you can sort of see that action happening. All right, so just a very slight camera and we're changing our focus from the front off to the back. Okay, so that's shot one. Uh, let's keep moving here. I'll turn off this animation pane for a moment and we'll switch over to another camera. So our next camera is the panning shot. So let me switch over to the pan. And again, I'm going to turn this just back to preview. So for our panning shot, I did kind of a pan across the wheels. So let's do something similar to that. Uh, I used a mid-range lens for this something, I think it was a 35 millimeter. So I'll set that somewhere around that range and we'll just kind of slide in here where something close to what we had. 
find a view that we like. Something like this, let's say. All right, now again, I'm not gonna use depth of field on this one. I just wanna slide across the model. So we can do this with our positional tools. Uh, I choose to just do this uh, through through the, the controls from the shortcuts. So let's uh, slide this down a little bit just so we get a little more of the model here. Maybe it'll look up just a hair. And again, we'll set a key. Control Shift K. And my next position, I want to be slid off to the side. And I'll just use the pan tool, which is the middle mouse button with Alt. Again, very slight. I always have a tendency to go way farther than I need to. Control Shift K just to make sure that key got set. And now we see a very slight movement across the model. Okay. All right, so let's move on to the next animation. Again, I will just kind of let these stack up here as I go. All right, so dolly in is our next shot. I'm actually going to skip right to the stabilizer shot because that's one of the more complex ones. Those two, uh, dolly and jib, are pretty similar, right? Just move from one keyframe to the next. Where the stabilizer shot, this one would be more difficult. So this would be one that we were kind of moving around the model or something like that with multiple keyframes. You can see all of the shots, um, actually every shot that I did in the video uh, that we've been, the videos that we've been looking. Uh, at and then the video I'll show you, show you at the end have been two keyframe uh, settings with the exception of the stabilizer shots. So I really prefer to keep things simple when it comes to cameras, do two keyframes, uh, let it go between them, uh, make your changes, and then string a few different types of those shots together. I think that works very successfully. Again, the stabilizer shot being the exception to that, which can be a more difficult shot to get smooth. Uh, but the reason why I wanted to jump to this one before we uh, end or run out of time here today is that there is a cool little tool in here that we can use to try to figure out what this uh, camera is actually doing. So let's set a few keyframes for this. I'll uh, start maybe um, from the back here, somewhere along here, and you can actually kind of see what the tool is that I'm going to be using here because you can see it up. Uh, so we'll start here. I'll set a keyframe for that, and then we'll move our timeline to two seconds or so, and we'll slide our camera around to the front side. Maybe I'll zip in just a little bit. Set a keyframe for that. And then maybe we'll move to just a front type view. Okay. So we can see that the camera will now cruise around, but we get this little kind of pop where we're going from keyframe to keyframe. And the keyframes are trying to smooth it the best they can, uh, but we still get a little bit of that snap there uh, where we're changing from one spot to the other. So what I like to do, and you have to be in your uh, preview mode to do this, you'll see the actual camera show up that you've added in. So if we move back to our free cam, all right, we can see all of our cameras here that are kind of in motion, all right, over the course of this timeline. So if we slide out here, we'll see we've got this ribbon here, which shows up and shows us what our camera is actually doing as it's sliding around. So this is our stabilizer camera here. And again, we can actually see this in motion as to what the camera is doing as it's moving around. All right, so let me move out here a little bit further. And we can see that it will say, uh, in, we can actually visually see uh, how tight the camera is as it, as it moves around this area. All right, so it comes in and then it kind of snaps in around here. Now what's cool is we can actually pick these points, these are our keyframe points, and we can manipulate these. So if I move over to uh, my motion tools, my manipulation tools, uh, I can choose move, and we can actually adjust uh, what we want this to do. So we can ease this a little bit by just making some changes to this. So I've just selected it. You can see I can change the, the point of the, our focal point. I can move this around to try to get this sort of smoothed out to a spot where it's not uh, it's not having such an impact on kinking the path in this case and creating that strange uh, kind of motion. 
so I can pull this in. Whatever I do to this path, again, I can I can see visually. And when I get things the way that I like, I can just move back to my stabilizer camera and those changes we'll see in here. All right, so we'll see that is actually a little bit smoother. All right, so those stabilizers type flying shots can be difficult to get set, but I, I do really like this system that uh, kind of gives you a visual of what the, the camera is doing across its path because you can very easily identify where you might have uh, issues uh, with the smoothness of the path. Now, if those are getting in your way and you're finding them uh, awkward to work around, you can turn them off, and that's this option here. So you can turn them off for all of them, or you can just turn off a single path. Okay, so again, I kind of like having this free camera that I can just sort of move, manipulate things that's not involved in any of the animations. And then I have the cameras that I set up for the animations themselves. All right, now once we want to go save an animation out, again, I choose a frame rate. Uh, I have my, <clears throat> my animation showing that I'm trying to uh, animate. Of course, you want to be in the camera that's actually being animated. And from there, you can move up to our render options, our output options, and you can save this out as an animation. So from here, you can choose where you want the file to go, uh, what you want the file to be called. I'll uh, always check this on to create the video. So this will create the frames in the video as an MP4, which is really nice. I, I use MP4 compression for just about everything. Uh, you can choose to pare down how much of the animation you want to go out. You'll see it's giving us a readout of 25 frames a second. And the render options control the actual size of things. Now I have my cameras set to 1920 by 1080. You can see that's part of the aspect ratio options up here. The reason why I do this is this is standard HD pixel size. So I just set that to 1920 by 1080. Uh, you would, might want to back that down if you want to speed things up. Um, this is a fairly large resolution to render at. Um, what I actually did for the videos that you've seen is, uh, is 1080, and then I actually just rendered them using the fast option. And I found that came out fairly nicely. All right, once you are set with that, you can start animation to render. If you wanna do several of these at once, so if you wanted to set these up and then have them all go, you could do uh, each one and just send a queue, and then you can have them kind of stack up and render when they're ready. Um, I've been using pretty much just start one when I'm ready to go and, and let it run, but I've played with the queue a little bit. Okay, so uh, I, I know we're getting real short on time here. Um, I said I had a lot to go over and we definitely did. So hopefully uh, some of those options gave you at least a kind of a flying view of uh, what you can uh, do with these, some ideas as to what you can do with these, and hopefully you can come back to this video and get some, uh, get some ideas when you've got a product that you want to run some uh, shots with You've got some ideas as to what kind of camera motion you can use uh, and very easily again with just a couple of keys just slight movements can make a really really big difference and I think it's uh, definitely one of those things where you can put in the least amount of effort and get the most amount of impact for uh, for rendering because the the setup time is is basically nothing and you can just let the thing render um, on its own and then uh, and then come back to it so I'll switch over to a video again kind of a, a fit finished result, if you will, throw some obnoxious music behind it, clip some things together. I did do some little bit of post-processing on, on these uh, that you'll see in the video. So I'll let this run. If you guys have any questions, if you haven't typed them in already, you can type them in in the uh, questions dialog. I'm happy to answer them. Uh, if you have any questions, even on the post-processing stuff, if you want to see how I did that, um, really easy edits on this, this, these things. I'm no expert in and after effects by any means. Um, so I think if I can do it, you guys can do it. So thanks for watching today. And again, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, if you think of anything after the, after the webinar, just give us a ring at any of the CAD Dimensions offices and we'd be happy to help you out. Thanks for watching.
Don't forget to check us out on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and our blog for more great content by clicking on the links in the description below. 